this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was the largest naval battle of the Second World War. It actually consisted of four separate actions near the Philippines between the US Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Japanese plan was to disrupt the American landings on the island of Leyte. In one respect, the plan was a success. The Japanese did draw off Halsey's third fleet, but... Ultimately, it was a disaster for the Imperial Navy, which suffered one of the most decisive defeats of the war. Joining me is Mark Stilley. Mark was last with us discussing Pearl Harbour in episode 155. He has a new book available published by Osprey titled Leyte Gulf, A New History of the World's Largest Sea Battle. It's lovely to see you again, Mark. So, uh, it's October 1944. Uh, what is the strategic position in the Pacific in the run-up to the Battle of Leyte Gulf? By October 1944, the Americans were fully on the offensive and they were closing in on objectives in the Western Pacific. And there was a debate in the American high command between the two theater commanders, that, that being MacArthur, who had the Southeast Pacific Theater and Nimitz with his C Central Pacific Theater. And they had different ideas how to conduct this next phase of the offensive in the Pacific. At this point, the Americans were closing in on the Philippines. And by so doing, they had the objective of cutting off the Japanese lines of communications between the home islands and the resource areas in, the, in Southeast Asia. So the U.S. Navy wanted this to actually uh, be done by taking Formosa, which of course is now Taiwan, with the same objective. They would cut the, the sea lines between Japan and, and the resource areas. MacArthur, though, for obvious reasons, saw it differently, and he wanted to conduct a campaign to take back the Philippines. And again, that would also serve to cut these, these sea lines off. There was a, a very robust debate between the Army and the Navy because neither one wanted to, to be secondary to the other. Uh, MacArthur did win in the end, and it was probably for good reasons. Uh, his plan was more sound. Uh, the, the plan to take Formosa would have required a lot more troops and a lot more preparation time, and it would have delayed the advance. So in the end, the Americans decided to incrementally take the Philippines. So their, their first step in so doing would be to land somewhere in the central Philippines, and the, the spot selected was Leyte which is an, an island there facing the Philippine Sea. And from there, they would build air bases, and that would give them the wherewithal to, to eventually advance towards Luzon. Luzon is the, is the main island in the Philippines. So that was the objective by attacking uh, Leyte in October 1944. And at that time in October, it was not decided yet where the advance would take place. So there was still debate ongoing. But MacArthur did get his way in the end. What forces are available for uh, the naval forces are available for the invasion, and they're split out. I said they're split. It's a slightly odd command structure as well, isn't it? Uh, it was a it was a very well not an odd command structure, but it was a very you know separated command structure, and that was a big problem during the battle. So, like I said, there were two theater commanders in the Pacific, and each one had their own fleet. So. The Seventh Fleet was uh, was MacArthur's Navy, as it was called. That was heavily reinforced to conduct this big Leyte operation, and that was under Admiral Kincaid. The Third Fleet, which was under Admiral Halsey, that was the the pride and joy of the U.S. Navy. That was the the most powerful fleet in the world at the time. It was the the home fleet for all the aircraft, well, for all the fleet aircraft carriers. So it was a very powerful naval force, and uh, Nimitz essentially lent this force to MacArthur for the Leyte invasion. It was going to provide cover to the invasion. It was still under the command of Nimitz, and the Seventh Fleet was still under the command of MacArthur, and the two didn't talk. They literally had, the two fleets had no direct path 
to communicate with each other. So that was obviously an issue here, and that was going to be exploited uh, by the Japanese during the campaign. The American fleets had a total of something like 235 major combatants. Those are destroyers and above. So a huge fleet, plus many hundreds of of amphibious ships and supply ships. In fact, the Americans landed more troops on Leyte on day one than, than they landed on D-Day on day one. So it was a it was a huge operation, both from a naval perspective and also a ground perspective. The Japanese, though, were were in a in a different situation by October of 1944. They once had the most powerful fleet in the Pacific but they had taken severe losses over the course of three years. And for reasons that we'll probably talk about later, they had decided that they wanted to defend the Philippines and defend Leyte, and by so doing, fight a decisive battle. So they mustered everything they could to do this, but the total available was 69 ships. So we're talking a, a force much smaller than the, than the combined American fleets. And the, the combined American fleets, who had aircraft carriers in both fleets, there were escort carriers in the 7th Fleet, and the fleet carriers were on the 3rd Fleet. So they carried a total of uh, 1,500 aircraft. And the Japanese had something like 375 aircraft, and most, most of those were land-based. Uh, the Japanese uh, carrier fleet by this point was, was very weak. It had taken a lot of losses during the preceding uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea in June. So they still had a number of carriers, but they had very, very few trained carrier pilots. So their fleet was quite weak, and the American fleet was still growing in power. It's amazing how many uh, carriers the Americans had at this period. I hadn't quite realized how enormous the American carrier fleet was. Because you just think, and it's not just those big carriers, there's all the smaller carriers involved that seem to be masses that never get talked about. Well, they played a big role in the battle, so I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about them some, yeah. What's the Japanese plan? They, they, am I right? So they keep trying to go for these elusive, decisive victories. What, what's their plan to prevent the Americans? Because they, they're, they're actually trying to, their plan is to try and stop the Americans landing rather than attack them once they've landed. Is that, that that's that was their plan? I, I, I think the Japanese plan is the most fascinating part of the whole battle because the plan is is so fatuous, so unrealistic in almost every way. The, the first part of that is that he, here they are in October 1944, and we just discussed the balance of forces, that they still thought that they had a chance to fight a decisive battle and turn the tide of the war. And and that that's ingrained deep in Japanese Navy psychology, is that ever since 1905, the notion of the decisive battle was, was everything. So they had tried that before. They tried it at Pearl Harbor, essentially. They tried it at Midway. They tried it at the Philippine Sea. And obviously those did not work, but they were going to try it again. So they, they were going to commit everything to conduct and win this decisive battle. Yeah, the plan was, as you mentioned, it was to actually stop the invasion. They had hopes that their fleet would be able to hit the invasion force before it got ashore. And he, here we get into the problems of this plan. So the Americans land on the 20th of October, and, and they actually they were in the approaches to Leyte Gulf on the 17th. So there were there were of October. There were many days for the Japanese to react to this developing situation. But the best that they could do for a number of reasons, a lot of it was due to just sloppy staff work. This plan got the bulk of their fleet, in this case it was the first diversionary attack force where they put all their most of their heavy ships in uh, under Admiral Corita, who played a big part in this battle. When the plan was finally fleshed out, the best they could do was get the the first diversionary attack force into Leyte Gulf on 25 October. That's five days after the invasion. Well, by that point, the American invasion fleet had come and gone, and they had landed 132,000 men and 200,000 tons of supply. So the invasion was accomplished. And so the stated objective of 
what the Japanese called this plan was the Shogo or, or victory operation, the stated objective was impossible. They could not get their heavy ships there in time to, to turn back the invasion. So from the very start, this plan had no prospects of success. But there were other problems too. too I mean, a lot of problems, and but we'll cover just the just the most uh, you know the most salient among them. Another problem was because, like we just mentioned, they their carrier fleet was ineffective in October 1944. So the Japanese, who were at the start of the war the master practitioners of carrier warfare, at this point the Japanese carrier fleet was a non-factor. So they did come up late in the planning process with this clever diversionary plan for their carrier force. We'll talk about that later. But the heart of this plan was getting this, this the first diversionary attack force with the, all the, most of the, of the battleships and heavy cruisers in the Leyte Gulf. Well, how do you do that with no air cover? So, so the plan was to move this force of battleships with no air cover, 1160 nautical miles from where it started in the Singapore area to Leyte Gulf. You know, that is a problem that that probably won't go off as you intended. And the whole operation was was very complex, as Japanese naval plans tended to be. But this is even more complex because here you are uh, with the fleet separated uh, by 2,000 miles. You have the carrier fleet in Japan. You got the heavy battleship fleet in Singapore. And there are other smaller fleets running around as well. So this this plan needed a high degree of coordination, which was not possible at this point in the war. And, and as we'll see, things did not go the way the Japanese planned. This plan was actually not a serious plan to turn the tide. What it was, was it was a, it was a desperate gamble. And the Japanese naval planners said as much. They even went as far as to tell the army, this plan is to give the combined fleet a fitting way to die. You know, let us do this. I mean, they said as much. So this plan is not a serious plan for victory. It is, it is simply a way to give the Japanese fleet a, a fitting and glorious end. What I couldn't understand is because, as you said, the key to the plan was, you know, it, it's so precise is the timing. Just as there are mustering to land, we're going to sweep in because there'll be uh, ships laden with troops and we'll, but they don't seem to be have anything hovering around to even get close to being there as they're landing. Because you'll know when you're. You, it's not when they're landing. They were trying to hit them when the just before they were landing, and that, it's that. Well, you've completely failed at that point. Where's your completely failed? That that just shows you this was not a serious plan for victory. It was it was fatuous in every way. So they had a lot of ideas how they were gonna keep track of the Americans. It's not because they had good intelligence, but they did uh, correctly assess the American landing place and the approximate time for it. I mean, they did understand how the Americans did business and their temple of operations. So they guessed that Leyte was the target, and they guessed that it would occur in some time in, in mid-October. But you need better than that to get your fleet there ahead of time to stop the invasion, and they didn't have that. Yeah, you need to be hanging around. So there's, uh, there's four real major engagements, I think, isn't it, to the, uh, the Battle at Leyte. The first being the Sibuyan Sea. This is it, this is Halsey's powerful third fleet, or components of it, that, that are uh, first take part in their the first sea action, isn't it? Have I got that right? Yeah, that was uh, on the 24th of October, so... Uh, and that was Halsey's powerful third fleet. So his powerful third fleet, which the week before uh, the, the invasion started, had just fought a major battle off of off of Formosa with the Japanese land-based air force. The Japanese saw saw a chance to to strike the third fleet with a, with a large land-based air force and to cut to the chase. That didn't work out. The Japanese suffered heavy losses. Really, at that point, the, the battle was decided. When the Japanese massed their land-based air forces and failed to make any impression on the Third Fleet, I mean, that just told you they were in for a tough ride when the invasion started. And at that time, though, the, the Third Fleet had 17 carriers, you know, light carriers and fleet carriers, an awesome force. 
Uh, however, for various reasons, and, and these were on Halsey, when the invasion started, there was no apparent Japanese reaction because they were they were slow to react. Halsey had no good intelligence on Japanese intentions for this battle. So it, people think that the Americans had great intelligence throughout the war. Well, that's not the case. And here again is such a case. The Americans had no idea what the framework of the Japanese plan was. So Halsey sends away two of his four carrier task groups. One's recalled in time to fight this battle on 24 October. But the point is that when he starts to fight this battle, he's only got 11 of his 17 carriers active. But that's still a lot, right? Okay, so so here comes the first diversionary attack force. This is Kurita's force of battleships. There are five battleships led by the super battleships Yamato and Musashi. There are three other battleships, there are 10 heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 15 destroyers. So this is a huge fleet, a very powerful fleet, but it has no air cover. So the Japanese had planned to overcome this by that day, on that morning, they were going to use all the remaining land-based air power to hit the third fleet uh, and, the, and therefore provide indirect cover to Kurita's fleet as it came through the Subalian Sea. So the Japanese tried this. They did have some success. Actually, they did sink a light carrier, uh, which is more than they had done since October 1942. Uh, but that wasn't enough. So the, the, now the third fleet was able to launch sustained strikes throughout the day against Kurita's force. So they did launch five major strikes, a total of uh, 252 sorties against Kurita's force, which had no air cover throughout the day. But... For various reasons, Kurita got off very light. The From the very start, the, the Americans focused on the super battleships. The one that was chosen for, for most of these attacks was Musashi. And she became essentially a torpedo sponge and a bomb sponge for most of the day. So she eventually was sunk late during the day on 24 October. Uh, she took, I think it was 16 bombs. Yeah, 16 bombs. 11 torpedoes, maybe as many as 15 torpedoes, but no battleship, even super battleships, can can withstand that kind of pounding. So she sunk, but she served a very useful purpose because other than that, there was one heavy cruiser that was hit by a torpedo and forced to return to Singapore. But other than that, no other ships were sunk or damaged enough to force them back. So Karita gets off light. Uh, he loses one super battleship, and one heavy cruiser is forced to return. But other than that, his fleet is in fighting condition, and his fleet continues to the east, headed towards San Bernardino Strait, according to plan, after which he would turn south and head to Leyte Gulf. So the Battle of Sibelian Sea was, even though the Japanese lost a huge battleship, it was a tactical victory for them because Korea's force was able to continue the fight and advance toward Leyte Gulf. Why did Halsey not pursue? His his boss, Admiral Nimitz, would not allow him to, uh, you know, to leave the Philippine Sea. So he couldn't pursue him, in, you know, into the civilian sea. But this was the time when the whole issue of the, the diversionary aspect of the Japanese plan came into play. By the end of the day on 24 October, he gets reports from his aviators that he has scored a great victory over the course of these five strikes. So... The aviators, as aviators always do, they over-exaggerate their successes. Whereas in reality, the, the Americans sank this heavy battle, the heavy battleship, Musashi, and sent the cruiser back. But the aviators claimed much greater success. So Halsey is under the impression that the center force, as he called it, had been crippled. So it was he did not have to worry about it. It, it might get through. The, the San Bernardino Strait, but he thought that the Seventh Fleet could mop it up if, if any elements did get through. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm talking to Mark Stilly about Leyte Gulf. Now, the Japanese plan called for the powerful Third Fleet to be drawn off with their diversionary northern force. The problem being... They can't seem to get themselves found. Is that, is that what happens? Yeah, that, that was a problem. 
Yeah, and, and on these big battles, you know, small events determine the course of big battles. But so on the 24th, as part of this big Japanese airstrike to cripple the third fleet, uh, to clear the way for the for Korea fleet to come through the Sabian Sea, part of that operation was to use the few aircraft aboard the Japanese carrier force. So Japanese carrier force sails from Japan, and sometime during September, so it was kind of late in the planning process, the Japanese realized that this carrier force was so weak, it really w- would not be able to act as part of the main fleet with Korea and provided cover. So that's when they came up with this this clever diversionary aspect. So it, it wasn't that they sat down and they thought, well, we know that Halsey is in command of the third fleet. We know he's very aggressive. We know he'll go for this. No, it, it was it was not that clever. But to give them credit, though, they did realize that since the Japanese carrier fleet had been the primary threat throughout the war, that the Americans probably would think it was still the primary threat, even in October 1944. So they dangled these four carriers under Admiral Ozawa to the north of Halsey. They closed to within 180 miles, which is pretty close, of one of Halsey's task groups, and it wasn't even located on 24 October. So so imagine if, if they had been a more capable carrier force that they could have you know, inflicted pain on the Americans, but... Anyhow, they launched this strike. It was so weak, the Americans didn't even know, it, didn't even realize and that there was a Japanese carrier strike. In fact, it was the last Japanese carrier strike of the entire war. It wasn't until late in the day, about 1600 on 24 October, that an American search aircraft finally found the Japanese carriers. So it's too late in the day to launch a strike at that point. But now Halsey has this decision to make. He knows that he is, or he thinks he has crippled the Kurita force. And now there's this Japanese carrier force to his north. And now he has to decide what he's going to do. His decision, whether or not to go north, and then Kurita's decision later on not to go into Leyte Golf are the two biggest decisions of the entire battle. I mean, if you can't pursue the main force, does he have the agency to, to pursue uh, uh, the Japanese carrier force? So at Philippine Sea, we, we mentioned that battle. The American carrier force uh, had had a major battle. In fact, it was the largest carrier battle of the war by far. So Japanese carrier force against the American carrier force in June 1944. And the battle did not go well for the Japanese. They lost uh, three of their their nine carriers, and more importantly, they lost almost all of their trained aviators. So the Japanese fleet was crippled, but it got away. So the Americans and Nimitz in particular were not happy about this, this you know, victory denied them, the, you know, the utter annihilation of the Japanese carrier force. Therefore, Nimitz put this clause in, in Halsey's orders that if he has a chance to destroy the enemy fleet, then that becomes his primary task. So if the opportunity is given, then Halsey needs to take it and make that his primary objective. And, and of course, Halsey did not need any, any encouragement to be very aggressive. He, he was going to do this anyhow. So here, here's Halsey on the night of the 24th when he has to decide what to do. He has these orders from, from Nimitz. Uh, he has his own mindset, which is very aggressive. You know, he, he missed a midway. He missed Coral Sea. He was not at Philippine Sea. He was, at the start of the war, he was a senior-ranking American carrier admiral. But he had missed every carrier battle in, in the war so far. So he was ready to go to, to hit these Japanese carriers. So his, his mindset drove him to go north. His orders from Nimitz told him to go north. The doctrine that the Third Fleet used, you, you don't separate your forces you keep your battleships with the carriers, you know, as a powerful part of the fleet and how the battle developed. He, he thought that the, the Krita fleet was crippled. So for all those reasons, but the big one is that, you know, the Japanese carriers were, had always been the main threat during the war. And here they are again. And uh, we're going to take this thing out. They're going to take this fleet out once and once and for all with a decisive battle here. And he had the wherewithal to do it obviously. Also on his staff, his staff had kind of a closed loop 
process when it came to making decisions. So there was no real debate on alternatives to taking the entire fleet north. So Halsey did not want to divide his forces uh, because doctrine said you don't do that. And uh, naval doctrine in general, U.S. Navy in particular, you know, you keep a, a strong striking force together. So for all those reasons, he decided to take the entire fleet and go north. And, and so doing, he does not leave anything, and anything means like nothing, not even a destroyer, to watch San Bernardino Strait. Uh, and that is where, that that's the only access from the Central Philippines into the Philippine Sea. So at that point, the Japanese diversionary plan's working. At that point, it's working well. Yeah, yes. Now, of course, the, it was a clever plan, no doubt, to divert the Third Fleet north, but there was no follow-on plan what to do with the Third Fleet after it had finished annihilating whatever was north. And and that comes into play later on, when, when Kurita has to make his mind up what he's going to do uh, on the 25th of October. And I, have I got the timeline correct before I break our timeline? Is the next action uh, the uh, battleship ba- versus battleship action? That Was it the only one of the Pacific War? When, well, that yeah, this is the Battle of Surigao Strait, and that happened that same night, the night of 24-25 October. It wasn't the only battleship action, but there were only there were only there was only one other that took place in November 1942 off Guadalcanal. So you know there are a lot of battleships in both fleets in the Pacific, but they did not go head to head very much at all. So. This is actually the least important of the four battles that made up the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So it's part of Carita's main fleet. They break off a seven-ship detachment led by two of the oldest battleships that didn't have the speed to keep up with Carita anyhow. So he was quite happy to to send these ships off for a secondary mission. And in fact, it, it was it was a diversionary attack. So they would come through Surigao Strait. They would hit Leyte Gulf in the south. And the main attack with Krita's force would come in from the north. He would go, go through San Bernardino Strait, head south, and hit the hit the Leyte Gulf anchorage from the north. This was essentially a sacrificial force to divert the Americans. This battle takes place uh, on the night of 24-25 October. The Japanese have only seven ships. The Americans have an array of ships, uh, six battleships, more than a dozen cruisers, heavy and light. and 25 or so destroyers. And the Americans had not done well previously in the war in night actions. Uh, they weren't well trained for it, didn't take it as seriously as the Japanese. Japanese uh, were very good at it, but by October 1944, it was the exact opposite. The Japanese had lost their edge in night fighting, and the Americans had radar, which they used very well, fully exploited. The Japanese, the Japanese had, had radar they, by this, this time, but they did not use it well. The PT boats opened the battle. They gave the Americans notice of the advance of the Japanese fleet, but they didn't really hurt it. But the destroyers sure did. And a series of shattering torpedo attacks, and these were torpedoes guided by radar, that the, the American destroyers shattered the Japanese fleet. They sink three of the four destroyers in the Japanese fleet, and they 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 hit, and it, it sinks eventually. Well, they hit, they hit both battleships, and one sinks due to torpedo damage. So... There are only three ships left in the Japanese fleet when it comes to the gunnery phase of the action. And, and this is when the last battleship uh, engagement of, of history takes place. Six American battleships facing one Japanese battleship uh, at the head of the of Surigao Strait. And the Japanese force is annihilated eventually. Only one destroyer of the seven ships survived. So uh, the seventh fleet had no problem taking care of this small Japanese force. Which then leads us back to the San Benito Strait, which is unguarded, isn't it? And Kincaid wasn't aware that there was no one watching it. He expected Halsey to have something posted there, didn't he? He he did, but you know Halsey gets a lot of uh, criticism for his performance during the battle, and some of it's deserved, some of it's not. But for some reason, Kincaid skates free of any serious critique of his actions. So. It's his job to guarantee the safety of the invasion, which is already gone, but but of the shipping within Leyte Gulf. And, and there was still a lot of shipping in the Gulf. The numbers 
uh, there were 23 LSTs and 28 Liberty ships and some other assorted ships, uh, including the most important ships, which, which were the three command ships inside Leyte Gulf. So it wasn't that there was no amphibious shipping inside the Gulf, but the the amphibious assault force had had long gone, had been long gone, and, the, and these were follow up resupply ships. So there were there were some ships of value inside Leyte Gulf, and to keep them safe, this was Kincaid's job. So he assumes because he had monitored third fleet communications because they didn't communicate directly. Well, they they did, but it what was not an efficient process, and I had to go through. MacArthur's headquarters. So he's monitoring third fleet communications. He hears them preparing to assign a force to guard San Bernardino Strait. Now he, he does not know, does not know that this was only preparatory communications to do this, not the orders to actually do this. So the orders to have part of the third fleet guard the strait were was not given. But he he assumes erroneously that it had been but Halsey's taking the entire fleet and going north now Kincaid does make arrangements to have flying boats and some of the uh, ships uh, some of the aircraft from his escort carrier groups located in the Philippine Sea to watch the strait but for various reasons it wasn't done in time or it wasn't done at all so the truth remains that there was nothing to watch the strait now, and this is Kincaid's responsibility more than it is Halsey's. That allows Carita the opportunity to go through there uh, just after midnight on 25 October. And on paper, I might say on paper, on paper he, he, he has a vastly superior fleet than, than what Kincaid has fit to face him off? On paper, certainly. And, and we just talked about the Battle of, of Surrogat Strait. So uh, all the heavy ships for 7th Fleet are busy during the early morning hours of 25 October are busy down there at Sargas Strait, which is south of Leyte Gulf. They're busy with that that small seven-ship Japanese fleet. But that still left three escort carrier groups up there off of Samar. Uh, and there, there are three. One is, there's one that's located fairly close to the San Bernardino Strait, it shouldn't have been there. You know, it's it's unexposed. If you're not going to watch the strait, you don't leave a, 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 a escort carrier group there protected nearby. So this is what happens. So when, when Krita's force comes through the strait, the first thing it encounters is this group of escort carriers located off Samar, and it's known as Taffy 3. Uh, so this is the famous Battle of Samar when Krita's fleet, which is on paper, like you say, very powerful. There's still four battleships. Of the 10 heavy cruisers, there are now six left because earlier in the battle, the Japanese uh, fleet had been ambushed by American subs in the Palawan Passage over in the western part of the Philippines. And there's a backstory to that, but Krita was not careful how he deployed his fleet. So he, he loses three heavy cruisers in the Palawan Passage. So he's left with six now. And he still has two light cruisers and 11 destroyers remaining. So it's still a powerful fleet. It runs into this, this escort carrier group, and it has six escort carriers. They are based on the hulls of merchant ships. So they are slow, you know, about 18, maybe 19 knots, full speed. They are unarmored, and they are poorly armed. And they are escorted by three fleet destroyers and four destroyer escorts. So... On paper, yes, it's uh, the American forces heavily outgunned. Well, so this 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 is the popular narrative of the sort of U.S. destroyers f- charging the Japanese fleet like sort of small angry dogs and forcing them to withdraw. Right. That that is the mythology behind the Battle of Samar. So the Battle of Samar is the most important battle of the four uh, that made up the Battle of Leyte Gulf and. As you said, there's this there's this underdog theme to the battle. It's a battle that features American destroyers against Japanese battleships, and against all odds, the Americans prevail. Now, without doubt, American destroyers and uh, the escorts were were extremely brave and very effective. 
but they did not win the battle. They did not defeat the the Japanese battleship fleet. This is a battle that was unlike any other battle ever fought in naval history. So a, a surface force surprises a carrier force, and uh, this fight is not just the battleship fleet against the escorts of the carrier fleet. It's against the carrier fleet and its aircraft. So people fail to realize that during the course of this battle, there are 200 American aircraft active. You know, just in the first couple hours of the battle, there were a total of 441 aircraft sorties from all the escort carrier groups throughout the day, but there were 200 during the first part of the battle. So it's a, it's a battle unlike any other because you had the surface force engaged by both small escorts or destroyers in this case, and and a large, continuous attack by carrier aircraft. And Kurita, for various reasons, lost control of the battle early on. And actually, it really wasn't his fault in this case, because when he stumbles upon this carrier fleet, and he had no idea it was there, but both sides were equally surprised. So uh, he spots this carrier force, and these are escort carriers. They are slow and they're unarmored. So uh, he had the time to fight a deliberate battle and you know, close the range and, uh, and and shoot these ships up without much difficulty had the fight been conducted in a more deliberate way. But he didn't know they were escort carriers. And in fact, these escort carriers were in a class that weren't even in the Japanese recognition manuals. The Japanese did not even know what they were. So Kurita assumes that he has found part of Third Fleet, that here's his chance to fight a decisive battle. He has stumbled upon a small part of Third Fleet, and now he will mop them up and score a major victory. So he thinks he, these are fleet carriers, and therefore they're fast. They're 30 knots plus. So he cannot fight a, a deliberate battle. He he conducts what is called a general attack, which is uh, all aspect, all parts of the fleet pursue the American force. And he had to do it that way because if these are fleet carriers and if he does not pursue them right away, they'll break off contact and, and they'll steam away and the battle will be over before it starts. So he has to conduct a general attack. It's a, it's a messy affair. And they never do realize that they're fighting escort carriers, not fleet carriers. And during the course of the next couple of hours, he, he comes under continual attack by the aircraft. Uh, these aircraft sink three heavy cruisers. And, you know, that's pretty, pretty good for performance, com- at least compared to the uh, efforts of the of, of Halsey's aviators uh, the day before. In any event, and to conduct a, a surface battle at long range, the Japanese really never were able to close the range on the escort carrier force. So this is a battle conducted at long range at least until the, the heavy cruisers succeed in closing the range later in, in, the, in the battle, it's hard to hit ships at long range. And, and this, this was proven throughout the war. Uh, like Java Sea, for example, uh, the number of hits were, were literally, you can count them on one hand, you know, 1,500 rounds, and there were a handful of hits. It's very hard to hit a ship at long range. And that's even in good conditions. And here at Lake Gulf, you have very challenging conditions for the Japanese. You have a lot of clouds, squalls. You have the Americans laying smoke. And you have the aircraft continually attacking your ship. So you're forced to maneuver. It makes it harder to get a fire control solution on these targets. Considering all that, the Japanese actually do rather well. There were six of these escort carriers. In this, this escort carrier group, the Japanese hit four of them. Uh, one of them is sunk by gunfire, and the Japanese also sink two destroyers and one destroyer escort. So they do sink four ships by gunfire, uh, but in the process, they lose three heavy cruisers. So can I? I was at which point, you know, they're they're in Leyte Gulf, which was their objective. They're sinking carriers. Oh, right, they've misidentified them. From their point of view, are they doing? Does it look to them that they're doing quite well? Well, he, he is pleased with the results of the battle, but they're they're not in Leyte Gulf yet. They're they're off Samar, so they are about at, at the end of this action. They're about forty five nautical miles north 
of the approaches of Leyte Golf. So at the end of this battle, and the battle goes on for the better part of two and a half hours, and Krita is never able to close the range, at least with his battleships, that never able to close the range on the escort carriers. And he he claims that he has sunk two carriers uh, by gunfire and that several others with torpedoes, which were launched later in the action. So he thinks he's won a major victory, but he still has the mission to press on into the Gulf. So uh, at about two and a half hours in, he orders that his force break contact and reform and then prepare to head into the Gulf. So he does make a tentative move to steam south toward the Gulf. And and here's here's the other major point in the battle when he decides not to press into the Gulf. So at about 1230 or so, he decides that he's not going to obey his orders and he is going to break off the action and head back north into San Bernardino Strait. Actually, he's headed back towards a phantom contact that came in that indicated that the Ameri- that, that there's an American carrier fleet north of him. And, and, and this is the most controversial part of his decision to, to not go into, into Leyte Gulf is this, this f- most likely, in my view at least, it's a phantom contact. Uh, it, it gives Krita the excuse to break off action, head north, avoid annihilation in his mind and and escape into San Bernardino Strait and survive the battle. Do you know what the phantom contact was? That would be int- intriguing. Or is it? You know, is he grasping at straws at something to almost... He was, he was grasping at straws. Uh, like, there's a lot of mystery to it. It was never logged into the, the communications log of the flagship. It, there was thought after the, after the war that it was sent to him by one of his Itajima, that's the Japanese Naval Academy, uh, classmates to give him an excuse to to fight a more fitting battle against this American carrier f- force to the north. But the, the bottom line is that neither Kurita nor anybody else who, who, were, who were leading these various parts of the Japanese fleet, none of them really believed in the show plan. Uh, this this plan had, like like, we just discussed it was not a serious plan for victory it it, it, it was a a desperate gamble and even in the japanese navy people don't always subscribe to to utter desperation and 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 senseless death so in Kurita's mind there was no reason to press on into the gulf because he he knew that the invasion fleet had been there five days earlier and he was not confident that it was still there five days later after the invasion. So had it been there and he was assured he could attack it, yes, he probably would have pressed on. But at this point, he knew he was, at best, he was going to face, he'd be able to shoot up empty transports. So he would sacrifice his entire fleet for what he thought was were empty transports. And of course, he was right in that regards. He, he had no situational awareness on any other American fleets around him. He had just shot up what he thought was part of the third fleet, but there were communications suggesting that there were other parts of the third fleet coming down from the north, you know, to support the escort carrier force. So he was aware that that the American forces were converging on him, but he, he didn't know where they were, how close they were. He had no comms with Ozawa, who led the diversionary force. So he did not even know that the diversionary plan, part of the plan, had worked. And then Halsey had taken off to the north. And that's because the transmitter on Ozawa's flagship was not working. So Ozawa tried to tell the other commanders, guess what? They're coming after me, but that word did not get through. Again, it's hard to coordinate these forces over long distances. So he feared being trapped in the Gulf for no purpose. And uh, when presented with the honorable alternative of attacking this phantom carrier fleet to the north, which was certainly more appropriate uh, than empty transports in the Gulf, he went for it. Uh, Now, and there was no prospect that he was going to, he was going to once again surprise an American carrier fleet in the Philippine Sea. But he went after this phantom force, didn't find it, 
and then decided to break it off and went through San Bernardino Strait. And he told his boss, who was Admiral Toyota, who was the commander of the combined fleet, he told him what he was doing. I am breaking off the attack in the Leyte Gulf, and I'm going to attack this force in the north, after which I will exit through San Bernardino Strait. His boss is the guy who came up with the plan. It's his plan, right? So even at this point, his boss did not tell him, no, you will stick to the plan. You will go in Leyte Gulf. You will sacrifice yourself. You will attack what's in Leyte Gulf. Even his boss didn't tell him to do that. So even he had no faith in the plan when it came down to it. So what happens to the diversionary force at the time? It, it, it can't radio that it's got holes on its tail. What happens, and it's this, the last remnants of their carrier fleet. Halsey was chopping at the bit because he, he, he had the means to virtually, perhaps even totally, annihilate this Japanese force. So the Japanese force is four carriers, one of which is the last of the Pearl Harbor carriers, and then three more light carrier conversions, and two battleships that were converted into semi carriers you know a very poor use of resources but he had this these two uh battleships still three light cruisers and eight destroyers that's the japanese fleet and by this time they were down to 29 aircraft well against them halsey takes the entire third fleet north and it it included three of the four carrier task groups and i I think the count is 10 carriers at this point They, they lost one the day before, 10 carriers and six of the of the, of the best battleships in the entire world. So there was the real prospect that uh, Ozawa's force would be annihilated. So on the 25th, the Americans locate the Japanese and who weren't hard to locate because they were trying to be located uh, by this point. So, so they got their wish. They were located and they, and they, and the, and Halsey launches a series of strikes on the, Japanese force, and uh, all four carriers are sunk. They also sink a, uh, a, a destroyer in the process. But but on, on one day here, all four carriers go down. But that's when Halsey has a different uh, uh, call to make because he's at this point he's starting to get pleas for help from the south, from Kincaid, who has his escort group surprised by the Japanese, and now they're under attack by battleships. So he sends a series of very panicky messages, some in the clear, to Halsey that we need your help because we're under we're under attack by heavy Japanese ships. And that's when Halsey, who who has sights of, you know, a, a new Trafalgar in it, you know, in his grasp, you know, he he does not respond quickly to these pleas for help. But if, if he had made the right decision, and in, in his mind he had to go north with his, his entire fleet, then why break off the action? Well, he gets these panicky messages from Kincaid, and then later on he gets a message from Nimitz, who asks Halsey, where are the battleships, Task Force 34, as it was known, as they were known? Where is Task Force 34? So this finally snaps Halsey out of it, and he does belatedly send the heavy ships down south. He still keeps two carrier groups in the north to finish off uh, Ozawa's decoy group, but he sends all the battleships and one carrier group to the south. And the timing here is important because he first gets the first, he gets the first message from Kincaid at about 8.22 in the morning, uh, but he does not break off the action until 10.55 uh, to send off the battleships and, and part of his carriers to go south. So at that point, it's too late. And he sends them to San Bernardino Strait to block the straits. The Japanese can't exit. And, and strangely enough, the American battleship commander does not act with alacrity. He does not steam as fast as he, as he can. So they, they arrive just hours after Karita has gone through the strait. They miss the, the main Japanese fleet. So d- due to Halsey's poor handling of the third fleet, which is the most powerful part of the American fleet at Leyte Gulf, his fleet, aside from the the airstrikes on 24 October, his powerful fleet does not meet the most powerful Japanese fleet at any point during 25 October. You know, they they fail to engage the main Japanese fleet. 
can we criticise Halsey for that? I mean, he, he's the man that gets all the stick, all the flack for uh, uh, let's say. Yeah, so he 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 deserves the flack, and not that he ordered his entire fleet north. I I think that that was a preordained uh, action on Halsey's part. There was really there was no prospect he would do anything else, given his mindset, his orders, and how the battle was playing out. So he went north with the entire fleet to fight a battle of annihilation in U.S. naval tradition. I, I think that's very defendable. But then he he dithers, sending the fleet back south when it's apparent that the main Japanese, the the only real threat to Leyte Gulf is is Kurita's fleet, not the decoy force. So see, he dithers. So as a result, his, his main force, which is the battleships, which were very powerful, six of them, they're pulled back before they can crush what's left of, of uh, the, the decoy force, and then they never arrive in time to fight Kurita down south. So they are they are useless throughout the battle. So the way Halsey uses his fleet throughout the battle, like I said, they had 17 carriers off Formosa, and of these, only 11 come into play at Leyte Gulf. His most powerful task group, 38.1, with five carriers, Essentially, it does not take part in the key battles on 25 October. So Halsey, at some point in 25 October, has the enti- has a third fleet splayed out all over the Philippine Sea. It's divided into several different portions. And here's a guy who kept the fleet together to fight you know, a battle of annihilation. But by the end of the day, the third fleet is all over the place. So he handles the battle overall poorly. So is it Kincaid that comes up smelling of roses? Well, Kincaid fights the battle of uh, Sorgas Strait, and, you know, that comes off well, right, because he has overwhelming superiority, and, and he does not take the, take the heat for leaving San Bernardino Strait unguarded. But Kincaid should not come off smelling like, like roses, because he let the escort carrier group be surprised. He doesn't guard the strait, you know, after the battle has been fought off Samar. He doesn't even arrange the rescue of the survivors in a prompt way. So he, he is, he does not do well either in the battle. One thing we should talk about though, is, is this notion that had Carita decided, well, I'm going to follow my orders and whatever come hell or high water, I am going to press into Leyte Gulf and I am going to destroy whatever's in there. And, and that's a very, that's a very prominent uh, myth and, and most accounts of Leyte Gaul is that Carita threw away victory. Well, uh, all he had to do was roll into the Gulf, shoot stuff up, and change the course of the war. So mythology is 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 quite strong there, and it's a it's a three headed monster that there was nothing in his way to get into the Gulf, and and that's that was started by Samuel Elliot Morrison after the battle when he wrote. This, his classic account of Leyte Gulf. And then the next part of this myth is that he that once he got into the Gulf, he could have shot up everything in sight. And, and then the third part of the myth is that had he done that, which was, a, which was a given, he would have changed the course of the war. Now, all of these are utterly and totally false, and they're not, they're not even not that hard to disprove. Kurita, after he fights the escort carrier group off Samar, he he takes losses again. He loses three heavy cruisers, and, and there are more destroyers who were assigned to rescue survivors. So his fleet at that point in the battle is down to four battleships, two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and eight destroyers. That's still a powerful fleet. But the seventh fleet, which had finished mopping up Japanese survivors at, at Saragossa Strait, it's a much stronger fleet. So could they have blocked the way of Carita in Tlaite Gulf? Yes. They they were they had plenty of time to get from Saragossa Strait up to the approaches, the the eastern approaches of Leyte Gulf. And his fleet at that point, six battleships, four heavy cruisers, five light cruisers, 39 destroyers. That to me sounds like it's a much stronger force than Carita's force. And also, by the way, Kincaid has considerable air power available to him. Three escort carrier groups. One had just been kind of beaten up at, at Samar, that's true. 
and there there were kamikaze attacks on on two of them during during the day on 20th of October, but there were still a number of escort carriers left, and also uh, Halsey's uh, large task group, task group 38.1, was coming up from the south, and they would have intervened at that point as well. And also, there's geography. There are two approaches in to Leyte Gulf from the east. And so just like at Surigao Strait, the Japanese had to come through a constrained area. The same thing would have happened again had Kurita, you know, pressed his way into the Gulf. So he would have been facing a larger force under heavy air attack and trying to battle against geography to get into the, into the Gulf. And it, 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 it's not a given that this would have happened at all. In fact, the, he had just shown that his force did not come off well in this, in this large battle just hours before. So how is it going to come off any better uh, against Kincaid's much larger fleet? And had they gotten into the Gulf, the American ships were all uh, positioned. They, they were prepared for the worst. So they, had, they had moved all their, their ships into the northern Gulf. So it probably, probably would have been night at that point. So Japanese have to find these ships inside the Gulf and sink them all. Yeah, under heavy air attack, under destroyer attack, you know, it, it's it's a scenario that makes no sense that this this attack by Kurita into the Gulf would have gone well. And the biggest part of this that you see in on almost every account of the battle that had he only done this and had he shot up all these ships inside the Gulf, it, it would have constituted a major U.S. defeat and changed the course of the war, or at least you know halted the American advance for months. And that's also nonsense. We talked about, about what was in the Gulf at that point. And there were, I think the count was 23 LSTs, 28 Liberty ships. So it's, it's not inconsequential, but the Americans had produced 1,000 LSTs and 2,700 Liberty ships. So even if the Japanese now get into the Gulf, somehow find these ships and somehow sink every last one of them, how does that constitute a major U.S. defeat? It doesn't. It's a logistical road, road, road bump. It's been in the bump in the road. Is that the analogy to the to the ground troops? It, it, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, it would have had some effect, obviously, but nothing major. And most of these ships were empty. They had already unloaded their their cargoes, and they were being held inside the Gulf until the battle was over. So it, there's no reason to think that uh, this battle, even had it, had it developed favorably for the Japanese, would have resulted in a major U.S. defeat. It was simply impossible by this point in the war for that to occur. It's a massive Japanese defeat. It's, I mean, it's fairly decisive. Is it 45% of ships committed were lost, which is 26% of all losses during the war? At which point, uh, would they not have been pre- better off you know, preserving their strength uh, using it elsewhere, <laughs> using it more judiciously. I I think so, and yeah, like like you say, it, it, I mean, if if there was a decisive feat in the battle, and and you can define decisive in a number of ways, but decisive means, to my mind, that the 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 force that's been defeated no longer has the means to carry on. So you know, for example, in that sense, then Midway was not a decisive battle. The Japanese fleet was not. Defeated, it was not unable to carry on after Midway. It certainly did, but after Leyte Gulf, though, it, it had it was decisively defeated. So I think uh, the count was twenty eight of the sixty nine ships were sunk just in, in, during the course of the battle, and many others never even got back to, to to Japan again. So that was the end of the Japanese surface fleet. And I, I think you're right that there were better ways to conduct this battle. Uh, than, than the Japanese did. Now, clearly, they they had every reason to defend the Philippines. And uh, Admiral Toyota realized that if the Americans cut the sea lanes, that that would mean that the Japanese fleet would have no fuel. Uh, well, those ships in Japan would have no fuel. Those down south of Singapore would not have access to munitions and other things from Japan. So it, it would have been a disaster de- development uh, you know, had that occurred. So the fleet had, to, so he was in a, a use it or lose it mindset, but that drove him to this desperate and utterly futile plan. 
So I think he, he would have been much better served had he held the fleet in, in reserve and continued to reconstitute the carrier part of the fleet, which was supposedly going to be done by November, build up their land-based air power, which was the key to the whole operation. I mean, if, if they can provide air support to the fleet, and that would come from land-based air, for the most part, they had a, they had a shot. Uh, so they they build that up, and perhaps they even they even build up a large initial kamikaze capability. Yeah, you know, it it was done in a very ad hoc way uh, during the late, late day battle. So they, they had all these things they could have done better. So had they fought a, a battle for Luzon in January 1945, and not a a desperate and hopeless battle for Leyte in October 1944, it would have been you know, much better uh, for them. Now, could they have stopped the American advance at that point? No, of course they couldn't have, but they they would have exacted a much greater toll. The battle would have developed uh, in a much more prolonged way. And that was their goal at this point in the war, was just to prolong these battles and, and make the Americans bleed as much as possible. Yeah, I couldn't help but think of this, sort of, because it, it's quite... It's metric by the end. You know, some sort of slow attrition, attritional actions by the Japanese would have much greater effect than trying to go for this huge gesture of the uh, decisive victory that uh, is more or less a, a mass kamikaze run on the part of the Navy. Right. And of course, well, th- th- that is true, but that wasn't their way of thinking. But yes, they they would have been better served had they you know kept the fleet in being throughout the war. But they still could have fought a decisive battle for Luzon in 1945 and and achieved much more than they, they did off Leyte. Fascinating. I don't think I have anything else. I was quite surprised. I hadn't realised that was the first uh, kamikaze attack. That was a, I hadn't realised that's when they first started throwing them in. Well, that was the first pre-planned kamikaze attacks. Of course, there were attacks throughout the war on an impromptu manner. But, but here for the first time, the Japanese asked for volunteers and they turned whole units into kamikazes so uh it was it was very effective you know because it caught the americans by a surprise on 25 october am I, am I right in saying i might have got this wrong the american ships are more susceptible to kamikaze attacks because they have wooden decks whereas the british ships weren't they had steel decks or if i picked that up wrong somewhere well that that's true as far as it goes i mean the the americans did not have armored decks like the british carriers did but in a kamikaze is really an ineffective platform against an armored ship, you know, a large ship or armored ship. Uh, against a smaller ship, they were they they could be deadly. But since they didn't have the 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 the, the power to penetrate armored decks, and they carried only a, a fairly small bomb, they could not penetrate British armored decks, for example. But they could do it against uh, American decks, which were you know steel and and wood. Uh, but they they never sank an American car- American fleet carrier or light carrier. They sank several escort carriers, but you know that's because they were they were designed to a much different standard. We, we have this th- there's this idea that they're uh, devastating, uh, and I am sure the people at the time uh, were very fearful of them. But I wonder how effective they were if you look at them statistically. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, they could cause mass chaos and mass carnage, but they could not turn the tide of a battle. They could not force the Americans to pause the pace of their advance. So uh, from that standpoint, they were ineffective. Of course, they were much more effective than conventional bombing attacks. And and from the Japanese standpoint, that that made this, you know, a a move that was quite rational. Uh, our, Our conventional attacks are totally ineffective, we're, we're going to try something else. And they were much more effective, but like you say, uh, from a bigger scheme, it was, they were militarily ineffective. Very good. Well, thank you, Mark. Loyal listener, if you want to buff up on the topic, the book to read is Leyte Gulf, A New History of the World's Largest Sea Battle. Now, if you have enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, you can find me on Patreon, patreon.com slash WW2podcast. I'm not sure what we'll be looking at in the next episode. I have a few shows recorded, but I need to get them edited and I have not quite settled on the order they will come out. But all been well. 
I should have an extra episode for you in June. So I will leave you with the mystery of what the next show will focus upon. For now, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.